Hello again and welcome to Money Matters. Hong Kong's aviation and travel sectors make up about 7% of the city's GDP. Millions of passengers used to fly through Hong Kong International Airport, but COVID-19 forced the closure of our borders. And quarantines have crippled the travel industry. Last month, Cathay Pacific took drastic measures, laying off thousands of staff and closing down the Cathay Dragon brand for good. Zella Chin reports on the future of the city's aviation hub. Airplanes sit and gather dust at the Hong Kong International Airport. An executive for Hong Kong Airlines says that though traffic is moving in and out of the airport, the numbers are still lower than pre-pandemic levels. And that's a mixture of passenger and cargo. And we've got some flights that will be both, so we're still carrying cargo when we have passengers on board. How many people are on this flight? Um, There's about 30% of the, the total um, availability so and and, and they, they vary from day to day they Where are travel they going? Uh, that's Taipei they may well be visiting a uh, family um, that uh, they haven't been for a while they live here but they're from Taiwan originally um, or uh, they, they there is people going for leisure while a few brave souls are willing to put up with quarantines and travel restrictions most passengers have decided to stay home. The airline says it has seen 90 percent fewer passengers fly with it than last year. Things won't be back to normal until next summer, depending on a vaccine and the relaxation of border controls. And the airlines cut costs to save money. In February, it laid off about 400 people from its 3,000 staff. And more recently, it cut cabin crew pay by 30 percent for four months. Captains and first officers had a 60 percent cut for six months. We reviewed the manpower um, uh, during very early on because we could see the impact that this would, would possibly have. So we, we right-sized the business to a degree then uh, very early on. And we continued to look at it throughout the pandemic. Liu Yu is a transportation analyst with a focus on the aviation sector. She says Hong Kong Airlines has struggled along with the other Hong Kong-based carriers and has had to trim costs. Going into the pandemic, they were already a smaller size and they were already fairly leaner than most other airlines. What's needed for them is a major cash injection, either from investors, from another buyer, or from wherever the government out or wherever else. Hong Kong Airlines reportedly received about $77 million from the government's wage subsidy scheme and more than $1 billion from Chinese banks. Many of these pilots took no pay leave, so it's a rare opportunity to see them practicing their craft. So this is inside the simulator, and as you can see, there's uh, pilots here uh, conducting their training. I feel like I'm moving. Like... <laughs> it does feel quite realistic. It, Obviously, it does, that's the whole yeah. point, um, that the pilots can do most of their training in a simulator, and then the latter part of it on an actual aircraft. And you were going to open this up to the general public? Well, it's something that we're reviewing at the moment. Uh, uh, under the current circumstances, uh, every airline, a lot of companies are having to diversify and really look to see um, uh, how they can generate revenue. Potential clients include flying academies and aviation geeks. And the airline has other ways to generate more revenue. Because of COVID-19, past year numbers have dropped drastically, hurting the airline's bottom line. But there's a silver lining. Air cargo demand is strong, thanks to a need for face masks and daily necessities. As I say, focusing very much on cargo, and that um, is delivering revenue. Shopping habits have really started to change through the pandemic. There's much more shopping online, and therefore a lot more um, cargo and, and, and general uh, mail that needs to, uh, to be transported around the world. The industry lobby group says the rate of transporting air freight has gone up by up to three times pre-pandemic levels, boosting revenue. Because of the pandemic in February and March, many passenger planes were cancelled. When you add the capacity from the passenger planes, it makes up 40 to 50 percent capacity for the entire air cargo industry. So when this 40 to 50 percent cargo space is gone, then demand is larger than supply, which means a lot of cargo needs to be imported and exported. But there isn't enough cargo space. 
In this situation, the price would be very expensive. Wu says member companies have seen revenues grow by as much as three times year on year. For our industry, especially the ones that have contracts with the airlines for air cargo space, the airlines need to commit every month, every week, storage space for us to help clients to transport cargo. And it can sell at the much higher price. Other travel-related industries aren't doing as well. It's 10 on Monday morning, and this group of Hong Kongers is touring Jim Sa Choi. After a couple of dozen steps, the group discovers a pavilion and view of the harbor. It's the first stop on a tour paid for by the Hong Kong Tourism Board to encourage spending in the city. Lily Aganoi manages the travel agency and says her revenues have dropped by 90 percent year on year. Personally, believe that outbound travel will not be returning until you know, like probably Q3 next year. So, uh, in the interim, we will be doing more local tours to you know boost local tourism. So now we have staycation, we have vacation, we have dogcation, meaning you could bring your pets and dogs for a vacation also. And then we have various local tours, like uh, hiking tours. And then we also have a cycle, you know, like uh, where you go to a pearl farm for appreciation. And then we also have llama tours uh, for walking and as well as enjoying the seafood cuisine. Yeah. Besides developing new revenue streams, she's made the business more efficient. For example, when uh, you know, like uh, we are handing a client's booking, there are ten steps. So we review them thoroughly and to see if we could make it to, you know, like the best is five steps. If we could do five steps, that means to say fifty percent, you know, more efficient and cost reduction also. The staff take up to fifteen days of no pay leave a month, and the government's given the agency about a four million dollar subsidy for six months, ending in November. If Lily can't generate enough new revenue, she will have to slash her staff headcount. We plan to downsize, you know, like next year. How much? Uh, we figure we will be downsizing about 25 percent to 30 percent. Hong Kong and Singapore plan a quarantine-free travel bubble. One flight a day to each city will carry up to 200 passengers, and they must have a negative COVID-19 test 72 hours before departure. The test costs about $240 in the SAR. Hong Kongers will have to download the Singapore Tracing app and take a COVID-19 test on arrival. But no quarantine is necessary on either side. It's a huge gamble for both cities. I hope that that is the start of other bubbles in the future. And if this travel bubble for some reason does cause another, even a very small spike in coronavirus cases, that would bode very poorly for Hong Kong in the future. A lot of other cities might actually turn their nose up at um, establishing a bubble with Hong Kong. The bubble was supposed to start on November 22nd, but it's been postponed by two weeks because of a spike in COVID-19 cases in the SAR. Starting November 23rd, Hong Kong residents returning to the city from Guangdong or Macau won't have to quarantine if they test negative for COVID-19 and register with the Hong Kong government in advance. But when Hong Kongers go to the mainland, they still need to quarantine for 14 days. And there won't be a China-Hong Kong travel bubble anytime soon. That's because Hong Kong is an aviation hub and port city and has many different entrances for people with COVID-19 to enter the SAR. Hong Kong as a city is leaky in a lot of different ways. And as we've seen in the various waves over this year, a lot of it has been caused by these small um, leaks in various industries. So it would be a major gain for Hong Kong, but it remains to be seen if mainland China will be willing to take that risk anytime soon. IATA predicts that air travel will return to pre-pandemic levels in 2024. And Chris Burt of Hong Kong Airlines says he's confident Hong Kong's status as an aviation hub can be regained. Hong Kong still and will into the future have a very important part um, to play in, um, in, in aviation in the region. Um, we've got a third runway coming up um, and a new terminal. And that investment um, is uh, very much needed for the airport for its growth in the future. The pandemic um, will not last forever. 
and um, however the industry may look different and things will change, um, there's no doubt about it, but I think there is still a very important part um, and Hong Kong will continue to play that part um, in, in aviation in the region um, as a cargo hub um, and a passenger hub as well. Coming up on Money Matters, luxury housing usually means high quality and excellent finish. Find out if that's true after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Money Matters. Many people like the idea of living in a quiet neighborhood with a beautiful sea view. In tonight's property episode, Alice Kahn takes our flat testers to check out the design and quality of a unit in a new project in Taipo. The development is located next to the Pakshek Kwok waterfront promenade overlooking the Tolo Harbor and the Pakshing Leng Country Park. Residents can cycle along the promenade and enjoy some peace and quiet. The nearest MTR station is the University Station. Residents will need to take a bus or minibus there. There's no mall nearby, but there are a few international schools. Built by the Great Eagle Group, the project is made up of 723 units. Flat sizes range from 357 square feet to as large as 3,000. It provides a clubhouse. Last July, the developer sold this complex for as low as $11,400 per square foot, a bargain for the science park. But does a discount mean a compromise on quality? We've brought in our guest examiners to check it out. We're going to look at a 595 square foot two bedroom apartment on the second floor. The couple bought this unit in August last year for $8.7 million. Ahead of our flat test, the developer brought in a contractor to fix some defects. This worker repaired the wall skirting in the bedroom Another fixed the aluminum cladding outside the living room. This wooden door frame came off and was fixed. Finally, Inspector Tim Chai Lam went to work. First, he checked the glass in the master bedroom. It is the uh, chip the glass, and the chip is bigger than 1.5 mm, so I can divide it is the defects. There were defects in the glass door as well. I found a bubble uh, on the glass and I also measured the size of the bubble. It's also bigger than 1.5 mm. Tim found a lot of defects in the glass. In this one, scratch, chip it, and bubble on glass. They have to replace it because there's some defects. I'm worried that the glass will broken under strong wind. Next, how's the workmanship of the flat? Yet more defects in the glass door to the utility platform. 420 at right hand side, 415 at left hand side. There's a 5 mm difference. So I think the door is, is not installed at the right position. Then Sim checked the plaster work and the paint. The work in the master bedroom was fine. Sim found more hollows underneath the plaster on the ceiling. There's some hollow sound on the ceiling. I'm sure that the skim coat is loose. So they should uh, scrap off the, the skim coat and we have tied the skim coat to the ceiling. Luckily, the walls and the ceiling in the smaller bedroom are okay. The toilet was next. The socket of the gas water heater is loose. I think there's one screw is missing. Also, the socket is also loose. He also found the bathtub was not installed properly. Uh, the marble is hurting. It's hurting my, my back when I'm sitting here. I think it's the bathtub. It's not installed at the right position. Reinstalling the tub could be a big job. What can a new homeowner do? I suggest to replace the other marble step to fit the bathtub. A drainage system test is a must. Tim filled the hand basin with water. No water leaking. 
The drainage of the toilet was also fine. Then he checked the kitchen. No water leaking. Sim spotted a drainage hole underneath this aluminum cladding on the balcony. He suspects it may be blocked. Because the, the, the dust or rubbish will stop in front of the four drain and will be block the drain after the heavy rainfall. Now it's time for a check of the layout of the flat. Surveyor Raymond Chan says the layout of the unit is reasonable. But he says the unit looks smaller than the official square footage. This unit is quite enclosed by a number of uh, quite thick structural walls. The L-shaped wall uh, in here, uh, enclosing our uh, toilet, is actually a structural wall uh, enclosing the lid outside. And also another piece of external wall at the side of this room. It really reduces the uh, internal floor area. All the units have to be enclosed by some form of wall. And uh, if we compare them with longbow thickness wall, uh, you lose about uh, maybe uh, 15, 16 square feet to the uh, fixed structure wall. Raymond found some questionable design choices in the bedroom. Raymond, there's an AC unit here. It seems uh, very obstructive to the view. Uh, yes, I agree. Uh, this AC unit is quite large. It uh, really served uh, all the uh, AC units uh, within this flat. But uh, this outdoor unit, I think, uh, can be shifted a bit. There were also some design problems in the bathroom. He found the marble decoration was not user-friendly. There's a water, uh, water tank uh, for the storage of uh, the flushing water. It is hidden. Uh, behind this uh, marble decoration. And I can't find any uh, access panel to the water tank. So if there is any uh, repair and maintenance work to be done in there, uh, it will pose a uh, difficulty. Raymond went on to check the master bedroom. The door seems very narrow. Is it user-friendly? Uh, I think it is a quite user-friendly design uh, because uh, if you have a large door, uh, the remaining uh, unobstructed usable space will be small. And with this door, it, it appears a bit narrow, but uh, now it's still enough for the passage of one person. And uh, with the door open, uh, the remaining unobstructed uh, usable space is uh, relatively large. And uh, because that, uh, a utility platform is basically used for uh, drying clothes and uh, maybe to store some uh, water park pad. The flat doesn't enjoy a sea view despite the project being located next to Tolo Harbor. It faces other buildings and might pose some privacy issues. We emailed the developer and asked it about the defects and the design issues. About the problems in the flat, the Great Eagle Group said, the contractor will make good all defects and will replace items if damaged. The design of the toilet water tank is based on considerations of design as well as the ease of maintenance. Richard Branson's Virgin Hyperloop has completed the world's first passenger ride on a super high speed levitating pod system it was a key safety test for the technology. Virgin Hyperloop executives hope it will transform human and cargo transportation. A Hyperloop system uses magnetic levitation in a vacuum tube to allow near silent travel. In the future, it is hoped a trip between New York and Washington would take just 30 minutes. No dinner service there. Josh Giegel, Chief Technology Officer, and Sarah Lucian, Director of Passenger Experience, seen here failing to look like the right stuff, hurtled through a vacuum tube at 172 kilometers per hour at the company's test site in Las Vegas. Now to find out if it's true what they say about trains going through tunnels. Yes! yes. <laughs> that was so good! And, uh, 
was awesome. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. Get a room, you two. The 15 second long ride was the first with real people on board. We advise the next ride they take to be the required 15 minutes. Drums, pots, pans, and giant pestle and mortars. These, along with stamping feet and clapping hands, make up the orchestra Les Mamans du Congo, an all-female quintet from Brazzaville in the Republic of Congo. The household items were the everyday inspirations for the founder of the group, and woman who still can't remember where she put the tablecloth, who says the real aim is to empower Congolese housewives and promote equality. They had most of the musical instruments to hand since all the members are housewives. That was lucky. The women sing uplifting songs to a mix of rap and traditional music in the local Lari dialect. The band has been enjoying huge success in Congo with African and European tours planned, but the pandemic struck a sour note and that plan is on hold for this year. In the meantime, they've started a program to counsel on women's health, household finances and family planning. For now, the group rehearses and tries to spread their message everywhere. Now that's a pandemic we really need. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. Next time on Money Matters, workers who upgrade or upskill themselves for a post-COVID job market are doing so online more than ever. For a few tech-savvy firms, it's turned a pandemic bust into a boom. Join us then to see how they do it. Good night.